Let's turn to, uh, I said First Peter, I'm sorry, it's Second Peter, chapter 1. Second Peter. Well, he, uh, we talked about verse 9 last time where we stopped that some have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. They've forgotten who they were. They got spiritual amnesia, don't even know whose kid they are. And they're wandering around, who, who am I? You a Christian? I don't know. They've forgotten they were purged from their old sins. And I told you that the good way to get a spiritual amnesia is get a good lick on the head. You know, the helmet of salvation protects the head. That's where your thinking apparatus is. A lot of believers get tired of the old hot helmets, you know. Why do I have to wear this old hot thing and strap it on all the time? And they take it off and rest a little bit. And while they're resting, and the devil walks up and just dough pops them right across the top of the head. And when he gets through with them, their head spins. They say, who am I? I don't remember. They've forgotten whose kid they are, and they wander around doing all kinds of stupid and silly and foolish things, hurtful things. And uh, they've forgotten that they purge from their old sins. Wherefore the rather, verse 10, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. You're not going to fall away. And as Rob pointed out in the, in the uh, workshop message, you don't, uh, there's a scripture about falling, uh, falling from grace. And really, the Greek is quite clear. You fall away from the grace principle. If you go into works and legalism, you go into a new, new ball game. The grace principle, God does all the salvation work and you accept it and you roll on from there. You quit trying to get yourself saved. A lot of people who are in legalism and works religion spend most of their time trying to be sure that they're saved. Did you know that? And it takes a lot of time and energy and prayer to be sure I'm going to hold out faithful to the end. But if you know if your roots are in Jesus Christ and the grace of God and he has saved you because he saved you because he saved you and he saved you not because you were good because you needed saving. See, some people think they're going to get good enough for God to save. You'd never in a million lifetimes do that. God saves us because of our dreadful need of him because we couldn't get saved anyway but by grace and that's how he worked it. And the, the roots of this church are deeply embedded in grace. People come here and they say, well, why is this church so different? Why are these people, they get hit and they wobble around and everything else, but they still come back. Why is that? Because their roots are in grace. Those who never root down in grace are the ones who spin away. And they end up out yonder wandering around in never, never land, trying to work their way in, trying to get God to like them, instead of accepting the fact that he loves them with an everlasting love. And our business is to walk with Jesus and be a blessing while we live on this earth. And we don't have long, so let's get busy and use the time, redeeming the time, for the days are evil, right up there by the clock. And it says, therefore, you see, here in this church, we run out of something else, do we just read the walls? Uh, therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Some of these days, I think I'm just going to preach from the walls, preach around the walls. There's a lot of good messages on the walls. One nice thing about this, if you get sleepy, you can just turn around and start reading the wall. If you don't like what the preachers say, you can reach over there and say they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Did you know there's an addiction that is, is a right to addict yourself to the ministry of the saints? A lot of times people say, well, they're crazy. All they study is going down to that church. All they want to do, just pray against demons all the time. Well, until we get rid of them, it's time to do that, isn't it? It's time somebody called on them. I imagine they told Elijah, my, you sure are, you sure are a cornball. All you study about is getting God back on the throne in Israel. Well, I'm glad he did, aren't you? And what an idiot Gideon was, farmer boy out there with 300 men and horns in their hands. Torch in one hand and sword in the other one. My, my, my. When he tooted the horn, they all hollered the sword of the Lord and Gideon and crushed the enemy army. <laughs> We may be crazy, but we're crazy like fox. You say, well, you're nuts. Well, I'm screwed onto the right bolt, I'll tell you that. And it'd be good for some other folks to get in that same position. Listen, we need an army of people, from, of God's people, marching in time with his timing, not trying to tell him what to do, not trying to make God do anything, but finding out what God's doing and falling in and say, I'll volunteer to go with you, Lord. And when you do that, boy, it starts, it takes off and you think, my, Lance, I thought I was just going on a little roll through the country and this is like a roller coaster ride. 
you get on the deliverance bandwagon, I'll tell you what, it may be kind of slow to start, you know. Did you ever get on a roller coaster? You stand out alongside, it doesn't look too bad, you know. They go clickety, clickety, clickety. You say, well, that doesn't look too bad, you know. And you get on that thing, you, you go up and you start going, it's going clickety, clickety, click. You think, eh, exciting. I thought this was going to be exciting. Clickety, 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 click, clickety. Then it goes up and it kind of stops and says, well, huh, we're about to stop. That's what you think. That's when the bottom's about to drop out. And whoosh, and then you hang on for dear life. And that's the way it is with deliverance. I mean, God trains you and trains you, and you learn and relearn and learn and relearn. You get delivered, then you minister delivered, you get delivered, you minister delivered. You think, well, good grief, this is sort of ta 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 And then all of a sudden the bottom drops out. And we we're off to the races. And then you begin to find out what real spiritual warfare is all about. And I'm convinced God's going to raise up groups across the country. He's already forming them, and I believe he's going to do it even more. Don't forget to pray for the Indonesian government elections in April. If the government should change and the Muslims were to get in with an ugly spirit toward the Christians, it could make deliverance hard over there. Right now the government is very moderate and they're very favorable to the Christians, even though it's a 90% Muslim country. And in some Muslim countries, they do not have freedom at all because they have these extreme Muslim elements that want to put everybody else out of business. So pray for our Indonesian brothers over there. They, he said, make your calling election sure, for if you do these things, you'll never fall. You're never going to fall away from the grace principle. You won't fall under legalism and fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. And those are the antidotes for fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And when you're overcome by fear, it's because, uh, John says, because the love for God has not been perfected or brought to maturity in you, and that love of God will wipe out that fear every time. And all of us are nibbled around by fear once in a while, and sometimes we're gobbled up by it. Do you ever have fear grab you and run off with you just when you thought you were well nigh perfect? And uh, then, you, then you suddenly got hit with fear and you had to stop and it just like stepping on a banana peeling and down you went before you thought and had time to uh, do anything about it and down you were and that fear got you, bang. The devil said, there, you're not so smart. And the Lord said, see, you still need me, don't you? He's always there. For an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is an interesting scripture here. You know, every Christian has an entrance into the Lord's kingdom. But he says that some people are going to have an abundant entrance. You say, well, that's for people like you. You're kind of wide. You need an abundant entrance, you know. And, but... Uh, He's talking about uh, for some who have proved themselves faithful and have followed the Lord and been obedient to him, there's going to be an abundant entrance for them. Everybody will come in because they're coming through Jesus Christ, but some will receive an abundant entrance. I don't understand all that that means, but uh, it sounds good. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. And talking about this abundant entrance, I'll tell you, you know, some of you never had this problem, but as you know, I've flown all over creation and back, and uh, these airplanes have lovely little bathrooms made for Japanese midgets. <laughs> and I have turned sideways and almost broken off the ashtray off the door many times. And... Uh, I can just get in there, and when I turn, there's no danger of me, of the plane jostling me at all. I've got an elbow on each wall, well, one elbow in the lavatory, one against the wall, you know. Uh, very, and I appreciate this abundant entrance. I, I like it, when, I like that doorway right back there. It's lots of room, you know, I can get through without brushing anything. For some, there's going to be an abundant entrance. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but that got you in a good humor anyway. And it's not that funny when you're actually going through those little bitty doors, I'll tell you that. But at any rate, there's going to be an abundant entrance, and I believe God wants to give that to all of us. And I, uh, it's going to be exciting when we get to heaven and see what happens, you know. You know, God has, had you ever thought about God has, has made so many beautiful and glorious things down here in the natural world, just natural wonders that man hadn't even been able to mess up yet. He's working on it, but I mean, he hadn't got them all messed up yet. 
And uh, even he has breathtaking things down here. And had you realized that heaven's gone so far out, do that that it's not. We're going to have to have our new bodies to really stand it. I think it. I think it might kill us. To see it like it is. Uh, because he is going to have so much completion and fulfillment there. Everything that you never got to enjoy down here is going to be exceeded in heaven. Did you know that? Don't worry too much. If you say, well, I never do get to do anything or go anywhere. Well, I've been most places, and I'll tell you this, every palm tree looks alike, all the beaches look alike, the oceans look pretty much the same. When you get up in the plane looking down, they look pretty much the same. The lakes are pretty much the same. See one mountain, you've seen them all. See one palm tree, you've seen them all. Uh, but I'll tell you what, when you get to heaven, it's going to be something else. I'm looking forward to that. People are always trotting off to the Holy Land, and I guess that's fine. But you know something? It's a mess right now. Unless I was going to there to preach and help people get delivered, I wouldn't even care. I wouldn't turn on my heel for it. Give me a picture postcard, please, and I'll just stay home, save the money, and go on preaching deliverance to somebody else. You go there and tramp the hills of Galilee if you want to. Uh, they don't know where Jesus was born. They don't know where he was buried. They don't know where he was crucified. They're just estimating when Jesus comes back and re redoes this thing, I'm going to take a personal tour, and I'm going to see. I'm going to say, see, I told you it wasn't there. See, it's over here. That's where Jesus said it was. And uh, he's going to have all the spots marked then because then we won't worship those things, and we won't give them undue importance. But they'll be interesting. And I'd rather go walk through a restored land than to walk through the one that's there now, wouldn't you? But that's just me. You know, I'm an old stick in the mud. But uh, I'll tell you what. You say, well, you're just an old crank. Well, it takes a crank to turn things. See, I'm old enough to remember when it took a crank to turn a lot of things. I, I remember when they had cranks on cars. Well, I heard about it. My daddy told me about it. But, no, I remember when they turned, they turned them with cranks. Uh, they didn't have the self-starters. You were the self. And you got out there and uh, wooden, uh, wooden, uh, wooden, uh, wooden. And ho hopefully it didn't have to wooden too many times because uh, about that time you were about ready to throw the crank at the tree. But um, it takes a crank to turn things. And you, it won't hurt for you to become a crank either if you're cranking in the right direction because that'll turn things over and get things moving for God. And if you spend your time and your life doing things for Jesus, you'll never have cause to regret. You'll always be glad that you serve the Lord. There's a song I'm going to have to trot out. I just had, I got a hold of a copy of it from the author of it years ago. And uh, it talks about if I were a millionaire, if a fame I had my share, the pleasures of this world before me lay. Uh, I'd stop and count the cost if my soul be lost. And it talks about heaven is my goal. There while ages roll, I'll be glad I serve the Lord. Heaven is my goal. There while the ages roll, I'll be so glad I serve the Lord. Now he's real to me. Soon his blessed face I'll see. That will be my great reward. Oh boy, I'm thinking about the rest of it. <clears throat> That's one of those that I have trouble with because I can't see the words. You can't see the words when you're crying very well. But I'll tell you what, heaven's my goal. I'm just passing through this place, friends. By the way, I've looked up the music to... Uh, this world is not my home. I'm going to whack that one across the devil's nose pretty soon. Because, you know, we're just passing through. We need to remind ourselves. Because otherwise we get all discouraged and despondent. We think, gee, what am I going to do next year, the year after that, and 10 years down the road, and my land, supposing I die in an old folks' home, and ha. You're just passing through. This is, you're sojourning now. And there's no way that you're going to be able to regret the time you spent for the Lord here. I'll be so glad I serve the Lord when I get to heaven, won't you? You will too. You'll wish that you'd spent more time for the Lord and less time on foolish things. You'll wish that you'd spent more time on the things that last forever than on the things that pass away. You've got to make the choice now. Nobody can choose for you. Nobody can make you do it. But if you'll choose now the things of God, you'll be so glad 
when you get, if you're not glad now, you'll get glad when you get to heaven. As a matter of fact, you'll be gladder here. You'll be better off than those that don't. Well, he said, wherefore I'll not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. He said, I know these things are coming. And he said, I'm not going to neglect to just keep poking you up about it and put you in remembrance of these things. You know them already, but you have to be reminded. Though you know them. He said, though you already know these things, I'm going to repeat them again and again. I want to stir you up so that you won't lose sight of what's really important and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet or fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle, in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He said, as long as I'm living, this old preacher is going to stir you up and remind you that better things are coming and that glorious things await those who walk with Jesus here and even better things lie beyond death's door. Knowing that shortly I must put off the, my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. The Lord had already shown him he was going to die pretty soon. Now, you remember, this doesn't sound like that Peter that was scared to death to die, does it? It isn't the same fellow. He's, he's been through some things since then. He's changed. And instead of being frightened to death for what men could do to him, now he talks about without any problem at all. He said, I know I'm not going to be in this old tabernacle much longer. The Lord Jesus has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. He said, I'm writing these things down so that after I'm gone from this world, you'll still have them. And sure enough, here, nearly 2,000 years later, we're still reading, and Peter is still stirring up to remind us that better things are ahead, that it is worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see his blessed face. When he calls us for his own, we'll have 10 million happy years to sing of amazing grace. It will be worth it all when we get home. So even if things don't seem to be coming out right down here, that's not the end of anything. We're heading toward the end, and the end is going to be all summed up in heaven. That's where the books are balanced. If they're not balanced when you leave here, they'll be balanced in heaven. Don't, worry, don't you worry about it. And another thing, too, we have to be careful not to be envious or jealous of the wicked who are prospering in this life. That's all they get. They have nothing left to get in the future. Even the religious folks who are prospering and raking in the money and skinning the suckers. That's all they get. That's all. They'll have no reward because they have their reward. They wanted the people to applaud and shout when they came on the platform, so they did. They wanted to be famous. They wanted their name to go down in history. They put their name on everything. They have their reward. They had their name put on everything. That's, but that's all. You say, but a lot of people get saved. A lot of people get blessed from some of these things. That's all right. But they don't get any credit for it. Because why they did it was to get their name before people. You say, well, don't you think they love the Lord? They might. But their love for the Lord is overshadowed by their desire for glory, honor, praise, money, fame, the intoxication of everybody looking, there's brother so-and-so walking on the platform. Now, there's nothing wrong with people anticipating that, but if that preacher, if that's what he's doing it for, he's sunk. He can deliver a, a message like an angel that'll bless thousands of people, but if he's doing it primarily to get himself before people, then he has his reward. He's before them. He, if he's doing it for the intoxication of speaking and being the center of attraction, then he has his reward. And whatever good is done, God doesn't credit to him at all. If he preaches the word, the word will not come back void. It'll, it'll bear fruit, unless he twists it out of shape. But if he's preaching a Bible message, you have to realize that things are not like they seem. I've often said, when we get to heaven... And God starts recognizing people. 
He's going to call on some little old lady, you know, that we never heard about and say, well, who is she? And the angels are going to all come to attention as she marches down there in front of the Lord. And they're going to say, everybody's going to say, well, who is she? I never heard of her. And the Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You spent all that time in the prayer closet. Nobody knew, but I knew. And you were the power behind a lot of the people who went forth. And they stood on the platform and glowed and said, am I not wonderful? Never recognizing that somebody in the prayer closet was pushing the power and lifting them up before the Lord. See, you've got to understand how God works. His whole work is a team effort. You, uh, you, you know, some people run around, you know, and they have notches on their gun, their gospel gun, you know. I got this many saved last month and last year. You know, they got so many notches on their gun. And, you know, most of those people they got saved were probably saved because somebody, maybe an ancestor three generations back, prayed, oh, God, have mercy on my family. They're full of heathen. I'm the only Christian. Please save somebody in my place. And maybe a generation or two went by, and then God answered, bang, and here goes this guy with a notch on his gun. Well, I got that one. And God was said, hey, I was answering that grandma's prayer back yonder. She wept and cried. I just had to listen to her. When she got to heaven, she reminded me every day, Lord, you promised. And then, you see, just be careful because some plant, some water, and some do the harvest. Now, of course, everybody wants to be the harvester because you get to drive the truck full of grain, you know. Ha, 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 look what I got. I got them all. <laughs> I won 11,000 last year. Well, what about the people who sowed the seed? What about the people who watered? And what about the people who call for workers to go into the harvest? And you, in spite of your impudence and your meanness and everything else, were out there and happened to let fly, and you were more surprised than anybody when they started coming in. Well, that's because somebody was pushing behind the harvest. And don't think God doesn't keep track of this, because he does. And he knows where the power is coming from. I've told you again and again, as I go out in these meetings across the country and overseas, those who stand with me in prayer and those who prayed for me over the years and those who pray and continue to pray for those meetings and pray for the outreach of them, you have an equal share in whatever is done over there. You may never see Indonesia, but if you prayed for those meetings and every Indonesian who was touched and blessed and continues to touch as the waves keep going from those meetings, you prayed for Rob and I as we went over there and, and the other fellows in the first trip and Australia, everybody that's been blessed by those meetings, you had a part and everyone, and you continue to have a part and you prayed about it and forgot about it, but it's still going on. The, the results are still reaching out. You and I have a blessing from God apart in the fact that the New Guinea people just above Stone Age, a tribe over there, they took it in the back New Guinea where they're just living just above the Stone Age. And I just got a letter saying that work is continuing to go on among those people. The deliverance that they set in motion, the Indonesians went over there, took the deliverance message. The message that was first gained by, to them from this church, from your testimonies, from your prayers, from your on the books and the tapes and the videos, the Indonesians were stirred up. And they reached out, and we have a part in everything they're doing. Now, don't get lazy and sit back and say, I believe I'll just enjoy the residuals with all these people out here busy working and bring this in. Just keep on moving, doing what God wants you to do. And when we get to heaven, oh, it's going to be a glory day. No wonder people are going to be so happy in heaven. When you and I see that the little we invested brought such huge returns, we're going to wish we'd invested a lot more. Amen? My, my, my. I think, uh, I think a lot of times about, you've heard me tell this, but I'm going to remind you again of an aunt I have. She came here to one of the workshops. It was a desire of her heart. She's up, she must be 80 now. And she got to come to one of these workshops. She had prayed for me from the time before I was saved. She started praying for me to get saved. And she prayed for me all the way through the service. She had two boys of her own. She prayed God would call one of them to preach. And uh, the oldest one started out in that direction. And then the devil tagged him and broke him down. He never made it to the pulpit. He's a good, good boy, 
good Christian boy, but he missed the mark on that. And she switched over her prayers to me because I was the one God called out of the family. And she began to bury in on me and pray. She prayed till I got saved. Then she kept on praying. And then she got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, got all messed up. Got over there with those hooping, hollering Pentecostals, you know. And we all, the family all felt sorry for her. She's a good Baptist girl, all got all messed up with that stuff, you know. And she just kept on praying. Just kept on praying for years. And then she kept praying for me and focusing her prayers on me because I was out in the field preaching. And because that woman spent a lot of prayer time in the closet, she never had to leave her house. She never had to preach a sermon. She spent time in the intercessor prayer closet. And she's got a big whack of, out of you. Every life that I've touched, if I've been a blessing to you, my books, tapes, or anything like that, or my ministry has been any kind of a blessing to any of you, got you saved, got you delivered, put you on the trip, helped you stay on trail, that woman's got a share of every bit of that. And I want you to know when God divides up the pie, there's enough to go around. You won't be go missing. I mean, you won't say, well, everybody else got a piece and my piece didn't come out. Yes, it will. God will see to it there's enough. And every person that shares keeps on sharing. And every person that gets a blessing from this ministry, any of my ministry, anything that's come out of my ministry, directly or indirectly, goes, she gets a part of that. You think she hasn't been wise all these years? Now, some people never even heard of her. But she's got a rich reward with the Lord. Just in what she, I don't know how many other people she prayed for, but I know she really concentrated on me, and it really paid off. And the funny thing was, her heart's desire was to come and see this church. She'd never been in one of my churches. She'd prayed for me for years as I pastored. And she'd heard about these workshops. She'd listened to the tapes for years and sent her tapes. But she never did come. She never, she'd always wanted to come and see the church, but she never did ask it. She said, well, I don't have the money. It's awfully expensive and everything. And the boys in this church put the money together and flew her up here for a workshop. And she told me, she said, now I can be happy to go home. I've had my heart's desire. I've seen what I've prayed for all these many years. And it was worth it all. Now, people, it's worth it all when you throw your life in the ring for the Lord. Now she's in the sunset side of the life. But I'll tell you what, her reward is great in heaven. Because she invested time in a nephew. A lot of other people didn't even notice. But she burrowed in. And look what's happened. Now that's just one simple housewife and mother and wife. And she plowed her life into intercessory prayer. And through thick and thin ups and downs, she hung on and kept praying and praying and praying. And look what happened. Doesn't that challenge you to pray? Now, sometimes you think, well, I can't do nothing but just pray. Well, don't, don't down it, people. That's what makes the rest of it go. That's what puts the power. That's what put gasoline, puts gasoline in the tank. You know, it's not very glamorous to be the gasoline. Did you ever think about that? I mean, it's hidden in the tank. Nobody can see it. Can't even hear it. You can hear the engine, you can see the car, but you can't tell where the power is coming from unless you know how it works. But when she runs out of gas, that motor doesn't make any more noise. And it, those wheels don't spin fast anymore. They come to a screeching halt. And prayer is the thing that, intercessory prayer behind these things is what makes it go. Don't ever let the devil kid you into thinking you don't have a ministry. Now that may not be your only ministry. You say, well, I'll just dedicate myself to intercessory prayer. Well, go ahead. And then, of course, one of these days while you're in the closet, the Lord may come and say, tap, 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 tap. Yes, sir. I have something more for you. To do. Oh, I'm, I'm just a closet prayer, you know, Lord, I, that's all I do. He said, yes, I've noticed that. Now I have something else I'm going to have you do. If you want to get in the Lord's business, get busy doing what you can do where you are. Do the work he puts in your hands and do it under the Lord, and you'll be surprised what will happen. And he said, I'm going to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And then he said, I want to write it down so you'll have it even after I'm gone. Verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. 
when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, things like the writings of E.W. Kenyon and some of these other religious, this other religious trash, that's exactly what it is. Cunningly devised fables. People who have been deceived and then put it into print. And other people coming along read it and get all tangled up and go into spiritual tailspins reading it. Be careful. Stay close to the word of God. Stay very close to the word of God. E.W. Kenyon is nothing in the world but a Gnostic heretic. Same thing John was fighting when he wrote 1 John. The old Gnostic heresy, and it's one of the cleverest disguises that's ever come up is Kenyon's writings. It's got it all cloaked up and made it sugar-coated, and many people, sincere people, dedicated people, have swallowed the pill, and it's poisoning them. But those of us who can see are going to have to stay outside if we're going to do them any good. You can't back off in the ditch with them. If you're going to pull a car out of the ditch, you've got to stay on high ground and throw a chain down there to pull them out. You can't back off down there with them. You'll have two cars stuck then. You've got to stay up on high ground. And you and I who can see this, we've got to stay on high ground and throw the prayer hooks down to tear down and destroy the works of darkness and set brothers and sisters free who are caught in this mess. And it is a mess. It spawned a whole movement across the world. And the whole idea is to weaken, to water down the thrust of Jesus Christ and the restoration of the church. I have personally seen it destroy about four deliverance preachers and two deliverance churches. It is deadly. It is like arsenic. You don't need much, just a pinch in the glass. You say, well, mostly it's water. I say, here, here, have this glass of water. I'm going to put one little drop of strychnine in it. It's nearly all water. You wouldn't be afraid to drink it, would you? You say, forget it. I don't want it. Thank you. That little pinch of strychnine is enough to ruin the whole glass. And that's what happens when you get that kind of poison in the midst. It ruins the whole thing. And what we have, the solution is to come back to Jesus Christ, the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When you get to reading, if you didn't get this, this Kingdom Theology paper is in the book room. I hope you pick up a copy if you didn't get it from the workshop and read it carefully. It will tell you about William Brannan the latter rain movement, some of these other movements that came along that have been so twisted out of shape. As far as I know, William Brannan could have well been a man with real gifts from the Lord when he started. I met a man who was miraculously and instantaneously healed with cancer, when William, a preacher in southern Illinois. And he was dying with cancer, had had no solid food in two months. He was down to 90 pounds, big six foot two-inch fella, just withered away to nothing. And he was so weak he couldn't even go in the meeting. His wife took him to St. Louis, and William Branham was just starting out. And he couldn't get out of the car. And that man came, and, and this preacher sat and told me this. He said, when? That man jumped in the car. Came, I, was, I was laying in the back seat. He jumped in the back thing and said, when that man came in the car, said, such power fell on me. And he said, he rebuked the demons of cancer and command would come out of me instantly. And in Jesus' name, and he said, I was immediately well. He said, I had no pain. I had no, I was weak, worn out from the battle with cancer. But he said, I was well. And I went that night and ate a big meal for the first time in two months. And I couldn't even eat solid food at all. And he said, I was instantly healed. And he did it in the name of Jesus Christ. So I know when that man started, he was with the Lord. When he ended up, he was claiming to be Elijah and going to raise his followers from the dead and a whole bunch of other garbage. Now he's got a cultic movement going. They're circulating his tapes. And uh, he, in his biography, he talks about later in his ministry, he had a dark angel that stood by him on the platform and told him who to heal. Well, that makes me have cold chills because I remember a demon approaching me and asking me to dump everything overboard and let them take over and for me to stop. And I wouldn't have to stop deliverance. It would look and sound just the same. He said, but you have to quit fooling with that Holy Spirit. That's his exact words. And he said, and you have to let us tell you which ones to pray for. And I remembered Brannon's testimony that the dark angel stood by him. He couldn't leave the motel room until the dark angel told him it was time to go. 
And sometimes he'd be a half hour, an hour late. People would be waiting, thousands of people waiting for him. And then he had to stand on the platform and he could only pray for the people that the dark angel told. He called him the dark angel. You say, well, why wasn't he suspicious? I don't know. When you get hooked into delusion, you just go further and further away. Unless somebody can reach you with the truth. Do you see, that's why I say it's necessary to have a band of prayer warriors who know spiritual warfare and who could stand on the sidelines and see what's happening and throw the prayer hooks out there to tear down the works of darkness and rescue those who are being led into delusion. I believe that's part of our job. Not to be critical, but uh, you say, well, you're critical all the time. No, I'm not, but I refuse to soft soap things and cover it up. I'm just going to tell it like it is. If people don't like it, they can go someplace else. You can get soft soap any one of these places around here. They've got dispensers by the barrels. They'll dispense soft soap. And soft soap, if you remember this, is 90% lie. If that's what you want, there are plenty of churches dispensing it. We try our best to find out what the truth is and stick with it. And the truth is very, very hard and uncomfortable at times. <clears throat> Especially if you've been dazzled by the era. I guess, and once you see it for what it is, you thank God for being rescued. Thank God for the Bible, the simplicity of it, huh? The simplicity of the gospel. If you're here, and you are, uh, <laughs> if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come in your heart, or you're not sure that you have, wouldn't you like to do it this morning? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure about it, you're not positive about your relationship with the Lord, that's the first thing you need to get settled. You could do it here this morning. Would you like to? Would you like to get it all threshed out and make sure? You say, well, I guess I'm saved. I, I must be. I'm not exactly a heathen. Of course, I'm not much of a saint either. But, you know, I, well, if you're going back and forth, if he like that, get it settled. Get your salvation settled on the Word of God. Somebody here could help you with that. All you have to do is come down the aisle and give the invitation. Say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. And Somebody will be assigned to you to take the Bible, go over what you're depending on for salvation, and if it lines up with the Bible, then you can know that you know that you know. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, you can get your salvation lining up with the Bible this morning. You can get the real thing. And that's what we're talking about. And if you're not sure, make sure. It's no, there's no disgrace in being uncertain with as much trash as is floating around the religious world today. It's, not, it's amazing that people don't get more confused than they are. But it is a sad thing if you go away confused. Don't go away confused. Let somebody help you. You're in a place where we're used to people coming for help, and we do have people who can help you. The body will, the whole body will be ministering here in a few minutes. And then if that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress, we encourage you by all means to come and receive deliverance from evil spirits. That's the way they work. That's the sign there in your life. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. And we have many people here who are willing and able to help you in these areas. And you can get one-on-one -on -one prayer in a hurry if you'll line up and come when we give the invitation. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. We make no apology for advocating what Jesus said. And he never revoked this. He never took it back. It's for believers. You can have it. It's for you today. And if you want to receive it, there are people here who can help you to understand about it and even pray for you to receive this baptism in the Holy Spirit, which will give you the ability to speak a tongue you never heard or never learned. And it's, it's for power, and it will help you in your everyday walk. You do need it. Another sign that follows believers, they shall line, lay hands on the sick. They shall recover if you have physical needs. There are people here who believe that Jesus heals and will pray for your in our firm infirmities or afflictions in Jesus name so if you need prayer when we give the invitation we're going to stand and sing now something about that name as we stand and sing it uh, come down the center aisle if you need prayer if you're coming for the first time for prayer or you've come from a long distance then by all means cut the line and come down the center and you'll be the first one to receive prayer